Hello and uh, welcome to Cheshire Audio. Now this is this is the, the, the tricky one. Um, it's another tweakery video and what I'm going to talk about is speaker cables. Or try to talk about speaker cables because I think if you have enough knowledge or if I had enough knowledge to understand the intricacy of, of cable and cable design and what makes a good cable or you know what, what's, what's involved in, in making these things work, I wouldn't be working in sales. I'd, have, I'd be the head of some corporation somewhere um, because it's a very, very complicated subject, very complicated. Um, and I'll try and sort of go through that a little bit, obviously with my limited knowledge. Um, and I think I've found there's different people when you talk to people about cables. It didn't used to be the case. I think people were much more accepting years ago um, about, you know, what, you know, the, what would and wouldn't make differences to hi-fi systems. And I think there was always a willingness to try. I think unfortunately the internet has sort of stepped in here and there's a certain element of people who some sort of um, contribute to forums or whatever who the sort of paranoid types who you know probably the same people who go on forums about saying that the government are hiding hiding things about UFOs you know and they'll they're sort of it's all snake oil cables can't possibly make any difference you, you're being conned um, people are just after your money and that sort of thing so there's that aspect of it there's the snake oil brigade um, they're always there it gets a bit boring after a while but there's it's it's almost they've not tried it generally or they've just read you know they're just they're just regurgitating what they're seeing on on the on the crazy end of the forums really then there's a sort of a group in the middle that um, will say well yeah they do make a difference but they can only ever be a tone control now that comes from a certain element of knowledge because up to a point that is true. Above that, there's the sort of, oh, I've spoken to people over the years um, who are really, really into cables, who think the cables make the biggest differences of all. Not totally, I've never quite gone to that degree with cable, but the cables do make a difference and there's an acceptance that cables make a difference and you have to get that right. So you've got your three, you've got your complete denial types, there's the ones who sort of, yes it does, but not in the way everybody says it does, and then there's the, the people who are completely sold on it. Everybody's right, I think. I think the, the answer to that is everybody is right to a certain degree. Now when you come to manufacturers, I'm calling them manufacturers, but actually in reality they just tend to be suppliers, um, well cable companies anyway. There's three different types of cable company. There's the ones with the very, very bright sort of design department or owner or whatever who have a deep understanding of how cables work, how metals work together, how coatings work, how connections, different types of uh, metals. I mean, people like Graham Nolte at Black Rhodium, um, Nordos, Kimber, I'm trying to think of some who have really, really switched on. Uh, Atlas is one, um, chap at Vanden Hull who apparently don't ever, don't ever ring him because you'll never get off the phone. Uh, it's one of obsessive, obsessive people. There's, there's that at that end of it. And then in the middle ground, there are companies quite often run by enthusiasts, actually, people who are very, very into the music, very, very into audio kit. Um, haven't got the knowledge to have stuff bespoke made, which is you know the area of the, the, the top end stuff is all tends to be bespoke made. There's this mid ground where run by enthusiasts, and what they tend to do is listen to as many off-the-shelf cables as they can out of all sorts of different industries and choose things that actually perhaps work in our industry that sound, sound good as speaker cables, sound good as interconnects, whatever. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, actually. I mean, it, obviously, the top end, the bespoke side, is very, very expensive to put things into production because you're having something, you're having something made in qu relatively quite small numbers, really. Uh, if you think about these cables that come, I'm talking interconnects now, but interconnect cables that come with CD players or whatever, these little uh, black patch cords, they call them, don't they? Um, which are probably two, three, four pounds, perhaps, if you bought bought, a, bought one on eBay. Those are probably made in the tens of thousands of kilometres cable-wise. There's a machine that can probably turn out a thousand, a thousand an hour. Things like, you know, there's, I, I can't imagine, with things like this is an order of blue heaven. It's a very, very low volume thing. Um, and getting over the initial 
set up costs for the machines and all that sort of thing is tremendous. So the, the things like that are going to be a lot more expensive. Obviously the price of some cables just gets really stupid and it does, it makes you wince a little bit sometimes looking at it and thinking, eesh. But actually there are some that I think kind of justify it. Um, and then there are some I think that are sort of, sort of British phrase of take the mickey a little bit. So I think there's elements right across the board. And the third, talking about the diff, so we've got your bespoke type, you've got the ones who look at other people's cables and repurpose. I mean, for instance, cord company started out like that. The, re, the very first very good uh, cord cable was straight, all the, all the componentry of it was straight out of the, straight out of the RS catalogue. It was RS4 core in, uh, screened into connect with RS plugs on. Um, and you think, well, surely I can just do, go and do that myself. And you could. I mean, you could just order the bits and make your own. I actually tried, when I was um, managing a shop at one point, I thought, well, we'll, we'll just make, we'll make our own version of it. But the time involved in making that, it wasn't worth it, really. It really wasn't worth it. So, I mean, that was about a £40 lead, and I think we could buy the parts for £12. Um, but by the time you'd spent an hour or two making one up and packaging it and all this, it just it wasn't worth doing. So we just kept, you know, bought the cord on him. Um, the third group is probably the one that's done the most damage over the years. It's the companies who decide that the cable industry is a good way to make money. And they'll buy in the cable as cheaply as possible, dress it up to look pretty, um, sell it at a high price, do loads of marketing uh, to get some good reviews. That sounds a bit cynical, but I think it kind of works a little bit. It's not so much nowadays, but it used to work very much with uh, reviews, that if there was a big advertiser, they never really got bad reviews because, if you imagine an editor, they wouldn't want to upset their big advertisers because that's where all the money comes from. And there's nothing corrupt going on, it's just one of those sort of things that sort of, oh, better be, better be nice to them, you know, they spend 20,000 a month with us or whatever it is. Um, so if you, if you had a big enough marketing budget, you could launch a product in the magazines and, and be taken really seriously whether it was good or bad, really. So there was, a, there was a group, sort of certain groups that did that. Thankfully, they kind of get found out and eventually they'll sort of, you know, mainly because dealers won't support it. If, if, the, if your hi-fi dealers selling equipment or cables or whatever else, they have to believe in it. They have to know that it works because their customers are regulars usually. I mean, a lot of my customers are sort of regular customers are good friends. I wouldn't want to sell, sell them something that didn't work really well. Um, so that, that kind of end of the business, kind of, they kind of get found out in the end. But unfortunately, I think that's where all the damage has been done on the internet and that sort of thing. That is, you know, people have looked at these things and thought, well, how can they be worth, you know, how can they charge 100, 200 pounds for this cable when it's only this inside? Um, so like I say, the snake oil side, right to a degree. Um, just acting as a tone control, correct to a degree. I think at the low end, there's lots of cables out there that just basically that is kind of what they're doing. They're just giving you less or more, more or less bass, more or less treble, more or less whatever else. When you get but when you get to the high end, the bespoke stuff, it's this deeper understanding of what's going on that that's where the real the real magic happens. That doesn't mean that if you've got a budget system that you can't improve it by, by putting better cables in. I mean, what I would the only thing I would say is don't spend loads of money on it. Um, they always say about ten percent. 10, 15-ish percent of the value of the system on cables, and I think that's fairly valid. Uh, I mean, there's things like the, the Black Rhodium. I mean, Graham is a clever guy. I mean, this, this, this is uh, two, by, two by three metres of this is 75 pounds. So it's kind of what you would call a budget. I mean, 75 pounds is a lot of money, but it's, it's kind of a budget cable. Decent plugs on it, nice, clear sound, um, unreactive for amplifiers and things. If you want to go a bit more, there's 120 pounds. This is uh, black rhodium twist. Um, so yeah, you, you sort of budget end systems, this sort of thing is better than using, because years ago we used to use Bellwire. It was just um, in the 60s, 70s. It was actually the, the cable that people used to wire the doorbells up with. It was a very, very thin two core cable. And anyway, I think it was around probably about 1980, so QED, who are, very, who are a very innovative company, to be honest, um, brought out QED 79 strand, which I was going to have some here to show you, but I've yeah, but I've left it downstairs, so I've I'm, I'm messed up. Um, QD79 strand was the first sort of recognised audiophile cable, really. And it was just a heavier gauge, 
version of Belwai, really. So it's a 79 strands, strands of good quality copper. Um, and it does, it was noticeably better. I mean, you will hear from people who say got, got physics degrees or uh, electronics engineers or electricians or whatever, all, all that matters is cross section. That's the only thing that matters. Or if you have a twisted, a twisted pair with a cross section of so much, then that's all you need with cable. Nothing else matters. And again, to a degree, they're correct. Uh, and I think with QD, the QED 79 strand, it was a much bigger cross section, so it worked much, worked much better with, with hi fi kit, and it was a noticeable upgrade over Bellwire. Um, again, I think the cross section argument, like I say, it, it is valid, but there is, a, there is a level above that where the interaction of metals and um, what did they talk about? I don't understand any of it, to be honest. Uh, prop um, propagation of signal. Uh, different different frequencies travelling down cables at different speeds, and you would have thought that, okay, the signal may be at ninety nine point nine percent the speed of light. So, so certain frequencies might be, other frequencies might be at ninety nine point seven. So what? Why would it matter? But apparently, there's all sorts of, like I say, intricate stuff going on that, which is why some of these cables that are really well sorted do sound musically better. They sound more involving. They sound like the music is less interfered with. Which is what we're all trying to do. The, the whole point of a speaker cable is that the signal from the amplifier gets to the speakers with no interaction from the cable. That is the ultimate goal. I, suppose, I think the actual truth of that is that every cable affects it to a certain degree. Um, and there's different ways of achieving that goal. Like I say, there's a twisted pair, which um, because that sort of um, protects from RF if you twist it. Um, there's like no dust have their own ways of doing things, these are just single solid cores of, of cable running down the silver plate, running down that. Um, then you get things like this which has just got loads and loads of shielding on. Um, this is a dry cable which the plugs come unfastened on, just tough. <laughs> Fasten the plugs up. Um, so yeah, there's different, there's completely different ways of doing it. All sort of kind of ultimately can give good results. But we're all sort of aiming for this 100% of non-interference of the cable. So how does all that sort of work with, with, with your hi-fi system? So if you, like I say, if you've got a budget system, then um, just something at the low end will just give you a bit more clarity and a bit more refinement generally. The better, cab the better cables just stop that sort of brittle edge that you get with, with a budget cheap, you know, the cheap sort of giveaway cables. Um, but don't spend loads of money on it because the, the system won't show the differences. In the medium range then you can experiment a little bit more with different types of designs and that sort of thing and you'll find that you'll get more openness and you'll get more refinement. Again not massive differences but no but worth the money quite often if you've spent a few thousand pounds on your hi-fi system and spending 500 on various cables can lift it again. It's worth doing it. What you probably shouldn't do is look at the cable and think is that worth 500 pounds as a bit of wire because I think that's that's a bit of a sort of rabbit hole that really. I mean it is kind of justifiable when you look at the manufacturing processes and look at what how how small a market it is. You can kind of just start to justify it in your own mind. Some people never will, and I think really you just have to plug it in, listen to it. Is it doing what I want to do? Am I willing to spend that amount of money on that cable to do that? And if that's the case, then you go for it. Really, the interesting point with cables is when you get into high end. Um, and a good analogy of this would be if you think of Formula One. I'm trying to think how much it would be, but say four wheels and tyres off a Formula One car would probably be £100,000. It's ridiculous money, but they're designed to the nth degree to do one particular job to the best that they possibly can. If you just put those onto your Vauxhall Corsa, um, actually apologies to people in, in Europe because, okay, Opel Corsa, um, all you're going to get there is a little family hatchback which has got slightly more grip than it had before it's not going to be worth hundred thousand pounds it's going to you, you probably think yeah I can hit it it's, it definitely feels a bit more grippy but it's not going to make that sort of value of difference but in a Formula One car getting those tyres right makes a massive difference because the whole machine is to such close tolerance that every little thing can make a big improvement 
I mean, for instance, if you if you then put the the, the wheels off your course or onto a Formula One car, it probably will, will be undrivable. It it wouldn't. It would be such a big mismatch that it wouldn't work. And I think that's true of high end hi fi. Really, I think that's the case. I think that's why we've got these cables at silly money. Uh, I mean, it's, there's things in the tens of thousands. Uh, I mean, Nordos particularly, they've got stuff. Um, Kimber go to the silly end of it. But if you've got a quarter of a million pound hi fi system and any little thing can make a big improvement to it, if you're at that level of, I'll call it obsessive, I'm not saying obsessive in a negative way actually, because I think having something that you're very, very into and will spend money on in big style, it's all a personal thing, It's all a, this, this is a great hobby, and some people have the money to go mad with it, um, sometimes they don't have the money to go mad with it, but go mad with it anyway, which is another story. But um, yeah, at the high end, it's it, it's a different world, and I think people who haven't experienced that and the differences it can make, it's a bit unfair to start shouting snake oil and uh, how can they charge that for that cable? How can they do, they're ripping you off and all? Yeah, I, I've heard of all those things, and it's a, it's a bit it's a bit of a shame, really. So that's that. Yeah, um, like I say um, right cable, nice and shielded. Uh, Nordus is really interesting stuff. Nordus is very, very clean and clear. Um, can be a little bit um, too revealing for some setups. So you need to get if your system is if you're, you've got your system really good and you're really enjoying it, Nordus will just make it sound better. Um, if you've got issues with the system where perhaps it's a bit bright or it's a bit bass light or it's a bit this, what there's things like Van den Hull. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend this, but you can actually kind of fix um, tonal issues with cables, or certain cables. Some of the black rhodiums are a bit tailed off at the top, a bit full at the bottom, whatever, and you can sort of fix situations. But generally what you want is to get your system as good as you possibly can, that you really, really love it, and then you start looking at the cables to improve that, because what you want is something neutral. You don't really want anything that's imposing its will on, on the sound of your setup. And all these brands do that. I mean, generally, Black Rhodium is fairly neutral, but there are certain ones, like I say. Nordus is all very neutral. It just gets better and better and better as you spend the money on it. Uh, Atlas, very, very neutral again. You get a bigger sound as you go up through the range. Didn't unbox that because it's sealed inside, just, just, just for your information. But this is this one. This is uh, um, the Hyper 3.5. That's what I use in the dam rooms. Um, probably my best-selling cable, 3.5, actually, because it's just dead neutral. Uh, very unreactive with different different makes of amplifiers. Some amplifiers don't like certain types of cables. Um, beyond the sort of paranoia and the sort of whatever else with cables, there's a few other things that people talk about. I had an email today about a chap saying, "Do cables wear out? Do they sort of do they age?" Up to a point, they do. Um, not in a sort of any sort of tragic sense. I think. I used to find with um, things like name cable and whatever that the, it, st it can start to oxidise up. It goes green at the, at the plug end and starts travelling up the cable a little bit after 20 years perhaps. And the way to cure it would be to chop a couple of inches off and re-terminate it. It doesn't seem to travel the length of the cable. If it's properly sealed in there, it's protected against the elements and it doesn't... Most, most of these cables are a copper based and you don't tend to get any issues with oxidation internally like that. I suppose ultimately you would. I mean, eventually it'll sort of manage to get in there and whatever, but I think you're talking like 10, 20 years before you would even think about having to replace cables, and I don't think you really ever would do anyway. Um, the other question I've come across is, why do you have to have equal lengths? Um, I'm not totally of the sort of think, thinking that you do have to ha have to have totally equal lengths of cable, left and right. Um, I think I have heard negative effect if you've, say, got a metre on one side and six on the other. If there's a big differential of lengths, then I don't know what's... I've never quite worked out what's going on. You could sort of say, well, the signal's got further to travel, so um, so that's what's affecting... You know, it's making the stereo, the stereo sort of mix is collapsing because your ears are hearing at different speeds. I mean, the signal is travelling so fast, you shouldn't actually be able to detect it, but do, something does happen. Now, the main thing I've noticed is that the, the stereo image does collapse if you've got too much of a differential of left and right. 
Somebody was saying to me the other day, and I had thought this in the past, that some of the, the actual load presented to the amplifier will be different from one channel to the other. I mean, obviously they're driving the speakers, but they're also the cable is part of that system as well. And shorter lengths, longer lengths, will sort of, sort of, the amplifier will see them in a different way and potentially could have a different response from one or the other. Whether that's true, I don't know. But it, I have, like I say, I have noticed this. I mean, ultimately you want them the same, so there's none of this comes into it. I think if you say you've got a five metre and a six metre, I can't see that it's really that important, really. Um, I mean, and the whole other area of this is the plugs, because you know, Atlas particularly are, are forever changing the types of plugs they use. Uh, and I've done a few demos to people who've uh, have had their old their older uh, cables reterminated, and there's quite big differences, sort of from from uh, from plug type actually. Um, they, when they went from, um, oh, I'm going to have to stretch my memory now. I, can't, I can't never really, can't really remember what they're called. But the pre, I've got to say the previous version of the plugs to the achromatic plug. They all have words that are difficult to remember. Um, there was quite a big difference in, in performance from ju just from purely t changing to a different type of plug. It's a much more a lighter weight um, connection on this one, on this version of it, and that that was quite a big difference. Uh, the, the different options on some of the black rhodiums and they they can make quite a big difference as well so it's every every little thing can make can make differences i mean qed were very much into um no solder joints and that sort of thing everything's compressed in that's pretty good um, i think the problem with solder is it's a little bit um a little bit random so unless it's done very very precisely it can, can have an effect what else do we need to talk about with cables um that might be it, actually. I'm trying to think if there's any more questions I've had with cabling. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say particularly that there's necessarily good cable brands and bad cable brands. Of the ones who design and do things right, I think sometimes it's system dependent. Uh, I know a lot of name equipment doesn't particularly work well with certain brands. They, they seem to work well with their own on particular cables. Nordos, funnily enough, does seem to work reasonably well with, with name. I've got a few customers using Nordos. And actually Atlas, um, Atlas Mavros with the high-end name stuff is amazing. Well, talking about name cable, that's just reminded me, the um, when, people, when you say that sort of cables can't make a difference, and uh, it's all to do with cross-section, which is, like I said, the, the, one of the, the, the main arguments about uh, cables, that, that there's no differences other than cross-section. Um, the original name cable, it was called NAC A4, and around that time, Lynn had a cable called K20. Cable Talk had a cable called uh, Cable Talk 3.1. Exposure had a cable, and they were actually all the same cable internally. They were all BICC 56 strand, and they were all laid out with a uh, positive core, negative core, with about a qu three quarter inch gap between. So they all kind of look the same. They were all different colours. Cable Talk was blue, Exposure was grey, I think. Lynn was grey, and the A4 was black or white. There was alternatives. Um, so it's all basically four different branded cables that all use the same thing that would sound obviously the same because it's exactly the same internal cable. They didn't. They, sound, they all sounded radically different. Lynn cable was quite... You'd almost describe it as dull and soft, but very, very refined. Uh, the name cable was very upfront, almost ragged sounding, but very exciting. It gave a real bounce to music and made it sound really exciting, but quite brittle at the top. And exposure and the cable talk were kind of in, in, in the middle. They were sort of um, smoother, but not quite as exciting as the name sort of thing. And the only differences between all of them was the coating. And I can't remember the materials that we use. Oh, is it PTFE and um, different plastic type coatings and uh, they use Teflons and also there's all sorts of different things that they coat cable. I can't remember now. It's a long time ago, but uh, they were radically different, radically different uh, to the point of telling. You know, I've had customers we complain the system was was sounding dull and so well, which what what's the system? Well, I've got this, that, and the other, and Link K20 and whatever. And so well. Take some name cable and try it with that, and it did solve the problem straight away. All of a sudden, the system was exciting. Or if it was, a, they had a bright setup and it was too aggressive. Well, do you want to try a K20 in there? So well, that doesn't it? That had to solve the problem. So, it, I just always found that interesting. They it, it did exactly the same copper internally, um, same purity, same configuration, same everything. But the difference was the coating, and that sonically made all the difference 
you could argue it was just as a tone control, but it's interesting. It is interesting. Like I say, all it's, this is a great hobby, and all these sort of mad, the sort of mad aspect of it like that, I just find fascinating, really. So anyway, yeah, that's speaker cable. Um, hopefully I won't get too many dislikes on this one like I did with the fuses. Um, like I say, some people get very, very upset about it. Um, if you don't think cables make a difference, I don't know. But I think what what you should be, you should always do with these things, don't take the internet's word for this, don't take my word for it. Anything like this, try and get to listen to it. A decent hi-fi dealer will lend you stuff. Take it home, put it into your hi-fi system. If it makes it sound better, it is better. And that's that's the advice, really. Um, all these things I've got here, the, you know, the cable tops, the black rhodiums, the right cable, uh, van and halls, all this sort of thing, are all available to be home loaned, to come into the shop, come and talk to me about it. If you want to try anything, let me, I'll give you a bit of advice, whatever. That's it, really. That's, that's cables. So um, lots of people have been asking for this. Hopefully I've answered all the questions. If not, give me a call, email me. The, I'll, Phone, phone number and the email are at the end of the end of the video. I should probably put them at the beginning as well, but I just want I like to keep, keep everything sort of quite clean. But if a lot of people don't watch to the end, because I get people asking, well, what's your phone number? Um, well, it's at the end of the video. You didn't get there. So anyway, um, thanks for that. I will be doing, um, I'm intending to do a bit of a competition again, because we hit the 5,000 subscribers. Uh, I just haven't gone with it. I'll do it. I'll do a, next video or two, I'll probably do a little competition uh, to win perhaps, perhaps a Cheshire Audio Mug, um, which reminds me, have a drink. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching, thanks for uh, all the nice comments, um, yeah, like I say, we're over 5,000 subscribers. Word fail me. Anyway, I'll see you in a future video, thanks very much.